So these are AI generated photos. So AI for some reason can't do hands. Uh, so if you ever notice, every every picture I've been using from the AI has extra fingers or missing fingers. <laughs> That's a cartoon. Well, the three fingers doesn't bother me bad, but the uh, two thumbs are really big. Yeah. Now you're going to be looking at every, every classroom and see what is wrong with this one. <laughs> <laughs> something to think about. Where's Waldo? Where's Waldo? Yeah. <laughs> everyone will be looking intently. Yeah, that'll everybody will be looking intently. I could, I could get away with anything. Get everybody look at those pictures. Well, probably about time, so uh, let's go ahead and get our Bibles out. Let's go over to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. We'll start off here with a prayer, and then we're going to be talking about a couple of things. First of all, we're going to let's talk about the story of Joseph. Um, boy, one of the best stories in the Bible, life of Joseph. Uh, really the best patriarch. You know, I, of course, the Bible wants us to see Abraham as the model of faith, but... You know, there's really not much you can point at Joseph and say he does wrong, you know, which is not true of Abraham, Isaac, certainly Jacob. Uh, Joseph really is a model of virtue in a lot of ways, and he has some of the best virtues that there are. Um, a lot of times in the New Testament, when people think about Jesus, Joseph is the one that they think about. That, uh, in fact, there's um, there was an old saying that the, the Jews believed that uh, when they would read, when they read Isaiah and they get really confused, they think, well, maybe there's two messiahs. One is the son of David, and the other one is the son of Joseph. And they would say son of Joseph because he'd be very virtuous, but he would suffer at the hands of his brethren. So, of course, the story of Joseph is a story of Jesus, and that's why it's so important. Well, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Would you join me? Righteous God and Father, we are so grateful that in the midst of our week, we have the time, the opportunity, the ability to come together Spend a few minutes in your word. And Father, we're so very grateful for the things we're going to be looking at tonight. To see your servant Joseph and to consider how important he is as a model of the characteristics that we are supposed to embody in serving you. And Father, we're grateful uh, to have one another and to look to one another for uh, uh, through all things. And we pray you'll be with us tonight. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Joseph is 17 years old. It's always kind of interesting whenever you get a, a little bit of a tidbit that gives you that sense. Um, kind of neat too, whenever we have teenagers in the Bible that are uh, of very high character. Can you think of any other teenagers in the Bible that were people of high character, or at least people that were probably close to their teens? David, very good. Jesus at 12, that's a, actually a good thing about that's a good thing. Mary. Mary, yeah, she's a teenager. Yeah, almost certainly. Daniel, Daniel. Daniel and his friends are almost certainly <coughs> teenagers, yeah. Um, Isaiah was very young. Jeremiah was very young. Uh, Josiah was 16 years old when he turned himself to God. Uh, kind of neat to see a lot of times the Bible, we're given a characteristic that, that, that there's, a, there's a character in some people that when they're very young, they say, hey, God is my direction. And that's just such a neat thing to think about. It's what we hope for every young person we know, that you'd say, hey, I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to make that my direction. Because when you don't do it early, what? It's a lot harder later. And there's a lot more you know, baggage that comes with your life. And you know, it just really is an incredible thing to find these people that early on in their lives uh, uh, turn to God. And Joseph uh, <laughs> turns to God here, um, and, uh, or is going to turn to God here in this story. But the story begins telling us some things about Joseph. Now, what do we know about Joseph? Uh, just some of the things that uh, you might consider here. What are some of the things that you know about Joseph at 17 years old? What do we know? <laughs> How was he viewed in his home? Gregor? Well, he was, he was at that point very responsible. I mean, he was tattling on his brothers later on. Yeah, um, yeah. And he seemed to have been, I mean, 17 would have been normal and trusted with the herd, but it just seems that he was just trusted with the herd. Um, and he seemed very <laughs> responsible and uh, amazing for a young age. So it's kind of interesting that uh, he's the one that's sent to watch over and uh, see and check on his brothers and report on his brothers. He's trusted like that. Um, so I like that characteristic. What else do we know, Ryan? In verse 3, it's almost like Benjamin wasn't born yet. I wonder if he was. 
Well, remember we said that uh, the time frame kind of overlaps in the last two chapters, so it is a good chance that he's not been born yet, so that might really uh, uh, fit some of this story. Which, by the way, if that's the case, then his mother dies while he's away, and that's kind of an interesting connection there, too, uh, to think about that. What else do we know about Joseph? Or Joseph's relationship and his family? What's the obvious one? He is the favorite. Yeah, he is the favorite son. Now, we talked a lot about this already. Jacob, don't have favorites. He has a favorite wife, he has favorite kids. Uh, his father had favorites. You know, it's, it's really a, a, a problematic thing that, that we see playing out. And we talked about how in the Law of Moses, that the Law of Moses would say things about the dangers of favoritism. We talked about how in James chapter 2, James said, don't hold your faith in Jesus Christ with favoritism towards others. Um, and now, that being said, I think it's natural that, you know, here are Jacob's kids, and how would you kind of describe them in general? Lump them all together, I'm going to say unruly. But maybe Joseph's not. So if nothing else, maybe Joseph is at least the easiest one to love. Uh, he's the easiest one, you know, it's <clears throat> maybe his brothers would say, oh, dad, he's your favorite. But Jacob might say, well, yeah, he's the one that's the easiest one to get along with. He's the only one that has embarrassed me or caused me great problems. So there's a sense where, uh, you know, while Jacob's favoritism isn't justifiable, there might be a reason why Jacob <coughs> does have this favorite uh, uh, thought to it. Right? You're gonna, that's uh, I was just thinking about it, even among brothers and sisters, there's favorites too. Yeah, yeah. And um, so it shouldn't be that way. Well, you know, like I said, sometimes there's a, I get along more with this person than that person. I, you know, and some of you who have families with lots of siblings, there's probably one sibling that you're closest to, maybe in age, maybe in interests. And I don't think that's really the issue of favoritism. Favoritism is whenever the things that we're supposed to be giving others, we're really only giving to one person. So what was Jacob supposed to be giving all of his wives and he was only giving one of them? Love, yeah. He was supposed to be giving them all his love and affection, and he wasn't. Uh, we can say the same thing with his sons. And so his, his issue of favoritism isn't so much that, like I said, I think it's kind of natural that you might say, hey, this is the son that causes me the least grief. He's the son I like to be around the most. But really, his sense of favoritism is that he's going to give this son things he's not going to give other sons. Like? Yeah. In a time when... Uh, colored clothing was not a common thing. Uh, whenever, in fact, clothing, you know, you tended to wear the same clothing day in, day out, and you, a change of clothes was an unusual thing. But to have this cloak uh, of many colors, whatever that looks like, you know, there's so many uh, artistic variations of it, but it's something extraordinary. It's like, uh, maybe if this was a, a story in 2023, it would be kind of like, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Zuli a second. It'd be kind of like if her dad says, Zuli, I'm gonna take you out, unlike your siblings, and I'm gonna buy you a brand new car. Thought you better get on that. Can you think how that would feel? Uh, that's kind of what this coat of many colors is like. Don't think of it as just a, he got him a nice coat. Think of it like getting a car. Like dad went down to the showroom and bought a new car. And how did you get your car? I had to work for it and save up for it. I got this old clunker and dad took him down and bought him a brand new sports car. That might be what we want to see here is kind of the feeling of these things going on. Now, the other thing you need to know about Joseph is the spiritual thing. Gregor said he has a character, but there's something important about him in verse 5. So he said, he's a dreamer. Now, I don't mean he's a dreamer like, you know, he's got wild ideas. What is the particular thing here? What is he doing? Yeah, he's a prophet. He's dreaming things that, uh, you know, and it's kind of interesting. So he says to them, hey, everybody, I had a dream. Let me tell you about it. Uh, binding sheaves. My sheaves stood up. Your sheaves bowed down to me. Um, you know, and his brother said, well, that's really interesting, right? <laughs> his brother said, yeah, what are you saying? Are you saying we're going to be bowing down to you? Uh, he has another dream. And in the next dream, he says, look, I, you know, I had this dream, and it was the 11 stars bowed down. Well, who else bowed down to it? Sun and moon. And this really irks him, because who's the sun and the moon? <coughs> yeah, your parents, your mother, and I uh, are going to bow down. And even, uh, even, even uh, Jacob's kind of like, oh, keep that under control, son. You know, that's not, uh, that's not the way it is. So, um, 
So it's kind of interesting how this uh, circumstance is going along, the favoritism, the dreams, 17 years old, you have a young teenage brother, and he's the favorite, and you can just get a feel, perhaps, what this animosity is all about. I, I hadn't caught this, but verse 10, it says his mother's still alive. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. I, I hadn't caught it until you said uh, earlier about his mother still being alive, that it mentioned his mother, so uh, she is still alive there. Um, so he's sent out to chase down his brothers, and in verse 18, his brothers see him coming, and you know the story. We've known this story all our lives. What did they do? Yeah, they say, look, here, come, here comes the dreamer. Here comes the dreamer. Go ahead. Um, before that, back with his dreams, it's kind of interesting that Jacob, even though he didn't like the dream, it says he held it in his heart. Yeah, it kept the matter in my, in the New King James, he says it kept the matter in his mind. Uh, that's interesting. I think of Mary. Yeah. Where she remembered all that stuff that Jesus was doing. Yeah. And so it's kind of like he had, he knew it was going to happen. He knew that it was, it was true, even if he didn't like it. I like the contrast with Mary because I think of the situation with Mary where, you know, Jesus at the temple. Jesus has just really made him angry, I think. You know, he's been gone and here he is talking and we've been worried to death about you. And it says, you know, he said, Lord, do you think I would be, you know, and. Uh, you know, she takes it in her heart, but it might be a, I'm going to keep this in my heart, but I'm going to scold you, you know, uh, might be kind of the reaction that we have there. Tacho. You know, when he went out looking for his brothers, he met someone, and I have a hunch, could it be the Lord? Mm, that, that man that he meets that tells him where to go? Interesting. I never thought about it. Never even thought about it uh, being something special. I just assumed it's a, you know, he's wandering around looking. His brothers are to be found. Uh, that's a, And just to say, it's kind of dangerous out there, too. Who knows who you're going to meet? So his brothers conspire. What level of animosity must there be that killing your brother is a good idea. Now, like I said, I can see 11 brothers and one of them saying, I'd kill him if I could. But I can see the other kids saying, hey, yeah, come on, really? No. But all of them, all of them, verse 20, seems to indicate they're starting to think of them. All of them, uh, but who? Reuben. Reuben. Oh, guys, why don't we, uh, let's just throw him in this pit. You know, uh, uh, let's just toss him in here. Um, but still, it is incredible to me to think, here are a group of guys that they could all think killing their brother is okay. Anybody ever thought about that? Um, I struggle on that, and that's an interesting point. Go ahead, Stephen. Was it Reuben and Levi that killed the Simeon and Levi. Simeon. Simeon and Levi, right, right. I was thinking maybe uh, Reuben was part of that so that he would realize that maybe we're not being over careful with our dad. Yeah, yeah. Well, I actually think that maybe this conversation is kind of tied into that last one. Because at this point, all of these brothers, if, if they all went in there after uh, Simeon and Levi killed, killed them and, and looted the city and took all these people, all of these brothers are a little bit bloodthirsty. There's something about that that makes murder not such a bad thing. And, and clearly, how do they feel about the familial connection? Nothing. You know, and, and, and again, we might move into that a little bit on Jacob. To say Jacob really kind of, you know, failed to foster a sense of unity here in this family. Uh, there's there's this outright animosity, so there's that sense of it too. But again, they don't see Joseph as anything other than somebody who makes their life miserable, and he needs to be gone. Right? Where you going? I was just thinking, going back to the, basically almost to the, after, after the garden, they knew that Killing someone was, was a sin because of the, and that. So it's been clearly held that killing someone was a sin since that time. Yeah, yeah. And you know, again, but one thing I think about though is the idea of but what's going to stop me from doing it? <clears throat> In other words, when Simeon and Levi wiped out a whole town, what was the consequence of that? Nothing. Really. You know, in other words, there's no sheriff that got called in and arrested them. There's no, basically, they kill dozens, maybe fifties, hundred people. Uh, we don't know how big the city was, it probably wasn't very big, but maybe let's say a couple hundred people at the most. They killed hundreds of people, and there was no consequence to it. Uh, they, in fact, they got rich off of it. So, with that being said, violence doesn't seem without the consequence there. I mean, if, if murder was legal, 
Uh, how many of you would have given it a second thought? You know, how many times you just said, you know, well, murder is legal, I got this paper. <laughs> Especially if you're you're a low moral character, you're just not, you know, because I, I hate to say it, but there's probably a lot of murders that aren't committed because people say, I don't want to go to jail. But if that's out of the picture, then maybe things change a little bit. Go ahead, Stephen, and you're right. Okay, right, go ahead. She said, you know, even today, we see people stoop to murder over, you know, worthless things less than this, even, you know, over greed and selfishness and anger at other people. And I think, I think especially even in a group of people, it might be worse that, you know, if one person suggests it, no one says anything, they're all going to go for it. Is that a Bible concept that uh, a mob is a dangerous thing? You know, the book of Proverbs, it says several times that a mob runs to violence. There's something about the mob, we use this term mob mentality, that when a mob of people gets together, it tends to lower our inhibitions to doing things we wouldn't normally do. So that's a, a, a kind of idea. There may not have been immediate consequences, but at the same time, Jacob had said to his sons, you may be yeah. odious among the surrounding nations. Yeah. And, I suspect that if they had an opportunity, they might have done something about it. Yeah, you know, if it were for the fact that in the next passage it said that God protected them and put the fear of, you know, his fear in the people, you know, that wouldn't have been, that wouldn't have been the case. So Reuben says no, we said. And Reuben says instead, let's do this. What? Let's throw him in this pit. Uh, let's throw him in this pit. Uh, we won't lay a hand on him. Kind of strange because it's a, let's just throw him in the pit and what? Well, I don't know. Leave him there. You know, it's not as though there's a part two to this. But Reuben has his own part two. What's his part two? Yeah, he's going to come back for it. You know, uh, and, uh, you know, this, this whole thing kind of gets, you know, uh, how serious were they that Reuben was easily able to say, no, let's just throw him in a hole instead. Uh, my brother threw me in a hole many times, you know, but, uh, you know, that was, you know, a, a brotherly thing, you might think. But they come to pass that Joseph comes along, they strip Joseph of his tunic, and they throw him in the pit. There's no water in it. Uh, you know, years ago we were in, in New Mexico, these limestone pits that were about eight or 10 feet. And we was kind of sad, there was a skeleton of a coyote that had gone in there and, and, and just died over time. You could see where he clawed up the walls trying to get out. And I always, I always, when I think of that pit, I remember thinking, I, that'd be like what Joseph was cast in. And, you know, you'd be desperate down there. They're just going to leave me down here. What's going to happen? So Reuben is away. Uh, we find out after a bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, Reuben is not here at the moment. In verse 25, what's Judah's plan? Yeah. You know what? It, you know, if we, uh, we kill him, there's nothing to us. Let's sell him. Uh, after all, not let our hand be upon him. He is our brother in our flesh. Um, okay, so what's what's going on with Judah here? What what's his perceived motivation? Money. Money. Yeah. Which is interesting. These are already rich guys. But maybe you know, like I said, that doesn't necessarily mean you know. It's ironic that rich people tend to be the ones who create money the most. So that might be some of it. Uh, maybe there is a legitimacy to Judah's. Well, I don't really want to kill him. But I do want him gone. Maybe, maybe Judah really does have some mindset like that. We're going to see some changes in Judah tonight uh, about his behavior. Well, his brothers listen to him. And these guys come along and they sell him. And verse 29, Reuben comes back and he's gone. So what do they do? What's their, what's their big story they come up with? They need to coat. Yeah. They get the coat of blood. They take it back to their dad. They say, dad. Look at what happened. Um, verse 33, here is, here is Jacob. It is my son's tunic. Wild beast is devoured him. Without a doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters, that's kind of interesting, plural there, of daughters, arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. For he said, I shall go down into the grave for my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. You know, all the things his brothers did, I think of this one. I could see really not liking your brother and, you know, hey, we're going to send him off and get rid of him. But then when your dad is just so crushed that he's saying, I'm, I'm just going to die. I can't. Then you did this thing. That has to have some impact. 
That has to be the thing that would strike me heavy to see them. We know that because later, in later chapters, the brothers are very conscious about it. Yeah. What do they say? What does Jude, did Judah in particular say whenever they're in prison? What does he kind of say about the circumstance of being in prison? <laughs> Yeah, basically, this is the consequence of what we did to our brother years ago, which is interesting that it's their brother that's behind it, but, you know, there there is a weight of what's going on there. Go ahead. I mean, this does make me wonder about Ruben not, you know, saying anything, kind of going along with this ruse to fool their father. It makes me wonder if what he did earlier was more of a selfish, selfish uh, sure. I'm, I rescue Joseph and take him back to dad, I'll be the... I'll be the favorite brother, or the yeah. favorite brother. Yeah. Um, it is interesting to say, why would Ruben go along with this? I do think your, 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 uh, your question is valid. And like you said, maybe it was because Ruben had a very selfish reason for wanting the rest of his brother to be, you know, to get his father's favor. Does Stephen, you have a cover? Yeah, I was kind of surprised that Ruben actually doesn't appear to have known that, that he came to the, kind of came to the bed and Joseph was gone. And he, he tore his clothes. He was really you know, aware of what happened to him. Yeah. And so somehow he was in his clothes or whatever. But yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it is interesting how it, uh, wherever Ruben was, you know, uh, to, to be surprised by this. Just point of question. So uh, Joseph and his brothers, they're men, Mennonites? Are, those, are they the Mennonites? Oh, Midianites. So, okay, so, so I tell you what, uh, I'm going to ask this question. The next question is, who is it that was sold into slavery? So I'm going to come back to that. So the Midianite question is a trickier one than we think. Uh, I'm going to ask, who, who were they sold into slavery? We're going to say, Midianites are the guys that showed up and they bought them. Yeah. Okay. It's a little more confusing than that. It is, and in fact, it's almost like uh, there's a misprint in the Bible, but it's in three translations, so... But I think that also goes along to like with Reuben. He had no idea why Joseph was gone. So what is he going to tell his father? You know, is he gone because he slipped further down in the spit? Yeah. The water? You know, Greg, you know, one of the things I wonder about is what if he got out and ran off? You know, and where's he at right now? Because I'm dead. Well, he did, you know. Um, that hurts me, but I don't think that's what Reuben is thinking. I think Reuben is thinking the worst. I think Ruben is assuming the worst has happened in some way. So it's kind of interesting. He might, you know, what, what happened? And there's a question about what could happen here. That's it's interesting. Um, so a uh, couple of questions here. Questions. Tell me real quick. What, how would you describe, I don't know if I want to say the errors, the, the problems here. What, what is Jacob's problem? We've already kind of mentioned it, but let's hit it again. Favoritism. 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 Like I said, the real problem with favoritism isn't so much that you say, hey, this person is what I'm, I'm most like, it's the, and the others aren't going to get my attention. You know, the others aren't going to get my affection. And, and that really seems to be a Jacob kind of thing, that Jacob is not a father that pays attention to his other children. He pays attention to one, he should be paying attention to all of them. Jacob's problem is pretty clear. Anybody see another problem there? That's really what I see, but... What about um, Joseph? Uh, let's, let's go to Joseph's brothers. Let's jump over. Joseph's brothers. Their problems are jealousy. Jealousy, yeah, jealousy envy. Uh, we need to know. We'll go back to this. We have time at the end in James when he talks about hey, among brethren, jealousy and envy can do some horrible things. Judah was very worldly too. I mean, he didn't mind people publicly knowing that he's going to prostitute. Like he, oh, like he would pay someone publicly, uh, very openly. When yeah, we, we haven't got there yet, but that's an interesting thing about that. And of course, like I said, if we throw these brothers out there in general to say they're bloodthirsty, they're, uh, you know, they're uh, maybe, you know, who's he married? Can and I? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, virtues in this story. Fundamentally, we're looking at envy. Uh, I was going to say a little bit of the money, you know, uh, and, and especially if Ruben, you know, might have had an ulterior motive there. Anybody else throw something at the brothers? Liars. Um, they, they broke their father's heart, and that was, you know, acceptable to them. Um, that that's another point too. Uh, what do you guys see? Negotiator. Yeah. Two shekels apiece. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a lot to talk, is it? So it's kind of interesting how that uh, how that goes down. Um, um, Joseph. What's Joseph's problem? Do you think it's just has a problem? I think mean, it's kind of uh, boastful. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I, I think 
a little bit of arrogance in your son? You know, I've told you many times, I have a little brother. And I know what it is to have a little brother mouth. And uh, that mouth, my brother used to say, Ryan, your mouth writes checks that your body can't catch. <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, you know, I, I can say I'm now a little brother, and, you know, I'm going to tell. You know, that was a, a common line in my home, and, you know, you can see that. I want to give Joseph a pass. Because he's 17, um, he's really just kind of acting like a teenager in a lot of ways. And it isn't as though, you know, his behavior is outrageous. It is tactless. It is, uh, you know, uh, not thoughtful of others. But ultimately... I would sure say stop short of being sinful or evil. And the other side of that is if Joseph is 17, all of his brothers are adults who should know better. Yeah, that's right. They're in their up in their thirties, yeah. So uh, absolutely, you know, absolutely great point. George? We really don't know Joseph's mind, whether he's intentionally that's true. He is, bro, or whether he's just relating the facts and yeah. Hey, I had a dream. You want to, you know, uh, uh, like I said, it, it, and it still might say, you know, attacked. You know, it still might be a, you know, his dad kind of is a, you know, you shouldn't say that, son, kind of a moment. Well, yeah, beyond tact, when you've got all those brothers in here, clearly the youngest with the favorites that I'm showed towards you, there's no way that he's living in that family and doesn't feel yeah. everything from his brothers. There's no way. Yeah. Uh, and so, so you know he's being a little snarky. Yeah, it does seem that way that, you know, again, like you said, you've got to know your brothers. They're not, you know, this is, you know, I always think of the show Seven Bob Brides for Seven Brothers, yes. you know, the Wild Brothers. These brothers aren't even that nice. They're not even that civilized. I mean, they're, they're, rowdy is not really the term I would use to describe them. I would say they are pirates. I would say they're notorious. Yeah, notorious. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, yeah. the man that came across them, I bet he knew exactly where those That's That's a great point. I, I never thought about that. But yeah, I bet it was a, oh, I know where they are kind of moment. I never ever thought about that. Uh, so, you know, all these things are good. Which is to say, well, is then Joseph guilty of provoking his brothers? It's kind of a silly question, I, you know, uh, because the point is, whether he did or not, what they did was way over the line. So, last thing I want to jump to was Greg's comment. Greg says, wait a second, who did they sell him to? Greg, why are you a little, uh, why did you find this perplexing? Is it an easy answer? There seems to be two people traveling, the Ishmael, Ishmael, Ishmaelites, mm -hmm. going to Egypt. And then it says the Midianite merchants came along, saw him, pulled him up out of there, and they sold him. So to me, Joseph's brother didn't get anything for him because uh, unless they're the Midianite, whatever, uh, merchants. So, verse 27, come let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Verse 28, then the Midianite traders passed by. Verse, uh, I just lost my place. Uh, verse, uh, same verse, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites. And then the last verse, verse 36, so the Midianites took him to Egypt and sold him there. A little confusing. What's probably the easiest answer? Well, they are all related because, remind me, who are the Ishmaelites? Oh, Linda, you were going to say. Uh, well, just that Ishmael, um, if I remember right, God gave him the, the count. Uh, country of Seir, and isn't that also Midian? So, so uh, it is Midian, but Seir's not Midian, but Midian is the place where Ishmael ends up. So you're right in, in that sense. So Ishmael was sent out to something to call Arabia. Now, that, so that's the Ishmaelites. Now the Midianites are descended from and, and no, Abraham's, Abraham is a Midianite, or Jethro is a Midianite, but the Midianites are also descended from Abraham. His other sons is a son named Midian. And Midianites are descended from them. So these two tribes both dwell out in the same place, and their, their fathers were brothers, half brothers. And so what we're seeing here, and by the way, we really don't see the word Ishmaelite used too much more again. We just see the word Midianite is an absorption. So uh, it's been mentioned several times, I think even in our class we've even brought it up once or twice, that by the time the book of Genesis ends, there, you don't talk about the Ishmaelites, you just talk about the Midianites, because that's who it is. Do we see those kinds of things happen elsewhere? Yeah. Uh, for example, the tribe of Judah, the kingdom of Judah. The kingdom of Judah was... Here's an easy thing to say, well, it's Judah, Brian. But who else? 
Simeon, who's never mentioned after the book of Judges uh, specifically. Yeah, Benjaminites. There were some Levites. So there's quite a few tribes, but they're all called Judah in about three or four centuries. In fact, the word Judah is abbreviated, and that's where we get the word Jew. Yeah. So, you know, in the New Testament, you were a Jew. Well, that's actually the same idea that pretty soon one word is the group that word for everybody. We all do it, you know. Uh, uh, most of us kind of take a word and, and do it this way. So what we're seeing here is actually a neat little key for us to understand that the Ishmaelites and the Midianites are more or less the same people. And then over time, when we don't read about Ishmaelites anymore, we know what happened to them. They're the Midianites. That Stephen mentioned, the land of Midia is where Joseph, or is where Ab uh, 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 Moses lived for 40 years. His father-in-law, Jethro, was the priest of Midian. So we get to meet these people again later on. Go ahead. I think maybe what Greg was talking about is it sounds like in verse 20 there's almost a little mismatch of pronouns that's confusing. Oh, oh. That it says, uh, my translation says, the Midianite traders pass by, and they, it sounds like the Midianites, draw Joseph out of the pit and sell him. You know, I didn't catch that, by the way. Uh, in my Bible, it has the brothers pull them out of the pit. But it also has the brothers in italics, which is an indication that that's not actually the word that's used there. So it's kind of interesting that uh, my translators, New King James, has filled that in, assuming it's the brothers. So, uh, you know, I can see why that's a little more confusing if, uh, if your translation doesn't put that like that. Um, go ahead. I was thinking, I think Judah, when he recounts this, says that uh, Joseph pleaded with the situation of putting him in the pit. So... There was the brothers were there with Joseph pleading from the pit, not this to happen. So, did I miss that? Um, I think it was in forty-two uh, when, when Judah recounts. Oh, oh, you know, Ryan, I don't remember that. Um, he said that Joseph pleaded with him, so that the brothers were all there. Joseph was pleading with them not to do this, but they did it. From I the did pit, not so. remember this at all. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you know, like I said, uh, um, you know, that, uh, um, very interesting. Um, verse 21, he pleaded with us. Wow. I never, ever caught that before, Ryan. So it sounds like they, he knew what was going on. That's were... really neat. Ryan, I never caught that before. Wow. wow that's, a, that's an eye opener to me that Joseph was down there in that pit pleading with him. I never saw that before. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, so like I said, it looks like we just have an amalgamation of a couple of people selling him, the traders selling him that they're really, their Ishmaelites and Midianites are really about the same people uh, by this time. And that's kind of the image that we're getting here. And so we're kind of uh, getting that sense of what's going on there. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts about this? So we put a pin on it here. And we jump out of time. I don't know how far out of time we're going. Uh, it could be years, decades later. Uh, I'm not sure. But when we go to chapter 38, when it says it came to pass, that's a little indication that time is going to pass on us. And we meet Judah. Now, uh, Judah now is going to marry who? Who's going to take for a wife? Shua. And she is a Canaanite. Now, is that a sin? Well, the law of Moses said not to marry, but the law of Moses hadn't happened yet. So, no, uh, it's not a sin, but when you go back to Esau, what is it? It's not a sin, it's not smart. Not smart, yeah. It's bad judgment. You know, we go back and we talked about Esau and how he had gone out to the daughters of Heath and, and married and, and just how badly that went for him. So, marrying a Canaanite wasn't a great decision. Um, he has these sons. And the oldest son marries uh, a woman who's named Tamar. She too is, uh, from what we understand, a Canaanite. Um, and then what happens to that oldest son? Why does he die? Yeah, kind of interesting. <laughs> Think about this for a second. Levi and Simeon wiped out a city and didn't die. But this son is so evil that he does die. So let that sink in as to how evil he might be. Uh, I have to think, Tamar probably dodged a bullet there, right? Um, you know, she really might have been in a bad circumstance, and when he was struck down dead, that was something, you know, uh, safe. Now, what is the what is the custom, later becomes the law of the law of Moses, what is the custom if, you're, if a man dies without having children? 
His brother what? Take, yeah, takes her as his wife. Now in this case, uh, go ahead. Was that just for the Israelites? Or were that for, was for the Israelites? So let, so let me say, because the indication seems to be that, well, here's the thing. God strikes the brother down here. So you'd think that would indicate it's pretty serious, but at the same time, like I said, I can't, I wouldn't, I'd be afraid to say anything more than it's just a tradition of the land at this point before the law of Moses. So if I have an answer on that, I don't really know how to, how to answer the question other than it seems pretty serious. Well, anyway, uh, the brother takes, takes Tamar, he has relations with her, but he intentionally doesn't give her a child. How does God do that? And? He strikes down the second son dead. Now, he's got a third son. Um, Judah says to Tamar, Say a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah has grown. Uh, and of course, in the back of Judah's mind, he's thinking, Yeah, yeah, you know, that, you know I don't want this boy to die. Um, kind of funny that he's looking at Tamar as the problem. Uh, when what's the problem? He's got wicked sons, and I can't help but feel like maybe Judah has not been a great God. Mr. I'm going to sell my brother. <laughs> so, all that being said, here is Judah's wicked sons, and well, Tamar, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll settle this when my son is older. Um, of course, over time, uh, Judah's wife dies, number one. Uh, number two, um, the brother's going to grow up to be old enough uh, to marry is, is implied here with the uh, you know, in verse 26 is the implication. But meanwhile, in this course of this time, Judah's wife dies. So kind of think about Judah. Judah has now married two of his sons and his wife. What does that do to a person? Depressed. Yeah, depressed. Depressed, you know, desperate for company. I, I think that, you know, we're, uh, you know we, we get a sense of that. Um, Judah's sons are dead because they were wicked and what do you think Judah's saying about personally? Judah's not a great guy. Maybe he's thinking, yeah, I should have died too. I didn't die, I don't know why, but uh, you know, I, I've been wicked too. Um, all I'm saying is that I sense that there's a great opportunity for a lot of reflection in this moment. To think about, well, you know, maybe I've done some things badly and poorly and, um, <clears throat> and right, so, uh, that being the case, I can see that up through verse 12, there might be a Judah that's really rethinking a lot of his life choices, so that the Judah we meet in a few chapters, to remind God, it's that really passage. The Judah we meet in a few chapters is a very different God, and I pin it right here as the big change. Well, anyway, Judah goes out and he visits a prostitute. He goes out to visit prostitutes. Um, and of course, he goes to visit a prostitute, and who is it really? Tamar. Tamar. Tamar disguises herself, uh, goes out, he takes her in, uh, he, um, you know, he makes this deal with her, and then, you know, instead of paying, he says, well, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, what's he going to leave with her? What's the pledge? Yeah, my seal, my staff. Uh, so I'm going to leave these things there. So um, he does so. And then when he tries to honor the, the debt, what? It's gone. Well, okay. That's that's that. Now, months are going by. What's what? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Joseph. Well, um, she wasn't really uh, she okay. She went out thinking that her that Judah's son was of age and that he was ready to be married to her, right. and that's why she dressed the way she did. She wasn't really just, I mean, at the time, going out to deceive him. That's an interesting observation, Josie. Verse 14 says she sees Shelah's of age, but Judah's not giving her his wife. Now, I think that this is a concoction of a plan. That she's got a plan to, you know, well, if Judah's not going to, you know, uh, you know, and, I, and one of the things I want to say later is why is Tamar a person that's actually esteemed in the Bible whenever you think this is a pretty inestimable story, and we'll, we'll come to that in a second. But it does seem that she's looking at this, and she says, uh, because it says very specifically, she was not, uh, that, that uh, Shua, I'm sorry, I get the sons mixed up, that Sheila was not going to be given to her as her husband. 
And that's kind of her reaction to, well, then I'm going to do this uh, kind of thing. That's what I think is happening, Josie. Now, it's interesting you say, what if that wasn't the case? Go ahead, I, I kind of cut you off. Right? No, I, I was just, maybe I, I just, it didn't go through right. <laughs> that's me. I just think that, uh, uh, that um, how much was there? Uh, Tamar. 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 She was very shrewd. She saw this whole thing the way it's developing. She basically had two rotten husbands that were killed. Yeah. He, she was actually entitled to the third son. And Jacob Ch and uh, Judah was denying her, specifically denying her that, which I think was probably sinful. And it, it, I'm not sure of that, but I think it was. At any rate, um, so she's a person in an impossible situation. She can't get out of it. She's very shrewd to recognize. This opportunity to take advantage. Yeah. Um, we'll come back to this in a second to talk about her a little bit more uh, and, uh, as we kind of finish off the story here. Go ahead. Well, I think that it must have been <laughs> like a custom that prostitutes follow the, the workers. Oh, sure. Um, because she went, where does it say that? She went to where she knew they would be. Mm -hmm. And it kind of indicates that there was a common custom for them to take prostitutes after they were done working for the day. Yeah. And I mean, she goes there for that purpose. Yeah, yeah. so very interesting how that, uh, uh, how she seems to know what the, what the custom is. Um, so a couple months later, what is, what is Jake and Judah here? She's pregnant. I know what's going on here. And what does he bring Tamar to do? He's gonna put her to death, which is interesting because, uh, you know, he's, he's put her off and now, well, you know what, I'm not gonna let this happen. You know, bring her out, verse 24, what's he gonna do to her? Yeah, let her be burned, wow. Uh, for being a prostitute, uh, she's committed part of the tree. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill her. Of course, you'd love to be in the room to see this. She comes in and she says, well, okay, but you know, let me tell you who the guy was and I don't know his name, but here's his, Signet, and here's his staff. And now, this is where I have to give Judah his credit. This is where I think Judah's a changed man because what does Judah do? You know, he could have tried to lie about her. Oh, I don't know any of this stuff, kill her. He says, She's more righteous than I am because I didn't give her a shell of my son. And he says he never knew her again. She has these children. Um, I would assume that by the things in the law of Moses, that that Sheila never married me either. Go ahead. I think you're right. He could have tried to cover that up. He could have claimed, oh, you stole this stuff from me. Yeah, yeah, easily. Or it's not mine. Or, you know, a lot of different things could have been said. I think Judah's in a place where, again, a lot of reflection. And, you know, he's seeing something here that's important. I want to, I, I really got a couple of minutes. And I really want to talk about Tamar for a second. Um, Tamar gets a special showing that whenever we're going through the lineage of Jesus, it, it's, it's wants to point out Tamar. It says, hey, here's Tamar, here's Ruth, here's Rahab. And you know Ruth, she the Moabitess, and you know uh, Rahab, Rahab the harlot. And now we have Tamar the Canaanite, and you know, a harlot, you know, uh, is, is a, what she's accused of here, I guess that's the main one. So you have those characteristics. But one of the other characteristics about Ruth and hey, Rahab, what uh, one of the real characteristics? They trusted in God. Yes, they were godly people. And I and I'm gonna tell you for the sake of time, I think Tamar is too. In fact, whenever Ruth chapter 12 and verse uh, 4 and verse 12, whenever Ruth has her sons, they say, You're as blessed as Tamar, who's you know the the, the, the mother of our people, you know, the one of those people. The Tamar. Interesting story that Tamar is not gonna be ridiculed for this, she's going to be praised for this. Now why? Why is Tamar somebody that we ought to say, hey, go ahead, Joseph. I'll take a stab at it. She was David's, King David's daughter, only daughter. That's right. There's a Tamar that is named for, uh, that, that's the same name later on. David will name, and by the way, I, that's one of those, they esteemed Tamar. They didn't ridicule her. So how could she? It's a different person. Oh, so it's two people with the same name. Uh, what was Tamar's nationality? She's a Canaanite, right. But wasn't David an Israelite? Yes, he was. And his great-grandmother was a... Moabite. Ruth was a Moabite. Moabite. His great-great-great-grandmother was Rahab, who was Canaanite. So David has a lot of 
un-Israelite ancestors. Now, what's even more interesting is David's descendant is Jesus. So Jesus has a lot of Canaanites in his ancestry and such. So it's kind of interesting that we do have this. And, and like I said, what's really neat is the Bible kind of says, and by the way, these are the virtuous people. Why is Tamar virtuous? Well, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's kind of like Jacob. Jacob wanted God's blessing so bad that he did some terrible things to get it. What does Tamar want? She doesn't just want a child. She couldn't go find another husband, I suppose. What does she want? She believes it's the rightful children. Right children. She deserves these. Inheritance. inheritance. What inheritance do you think she's after? She wants to be in Israel. She wants to be in this family. Now, never tells us much about Tamar. It just leaves us out there to say, hey, Tamar is a great person, and we're kind of left to wonder why. Well, we have to say for ourselves. She wants to be an Israelite. She wants to be in this family. She wants to be in this family so bad, she's willing to risk getting burned alive to get in. And that's the kind of thing that God loves. People that say, I want God's blessing so bad, what do I got to do to get them? I'm ready to do it. That was Jacob. It isn't that God is saying, hey, what Jacob did is good. It isn't saying what Tamar did was good. But what is, what is it that the virtue here it doesn't say that Rahab's lying was good. But the virtue in each of these cases was that these people said, I want to be a part of God's family so bad, I'll do whatever I have to do. Uh, Rahab risks her life. Ruth risks her life. Tamar risks her life just so they can be a part of this family. A family that the rest of these people are kind of like, oh, big deal. But these people say, no, it is a big deal. And I want in. And whatever I got to do, I'm willing to do it. So Tamar gets in here, and Tamar becomes part of the lineage of Jesus. We're going to stop here at a time. Thanks so much. Uh, really neat stuff. Ryan, that was a neat comment. I'm uh, really uh, uh, impressed. Uh, I'll be thinking about that for a while. Never, ever saw it before. I think Joseph did that.
grab your Bibles real quick and let's go over to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Um, I read an article today that I thought was real interesting and I wanted to share it with you and I wanted to share you the picture that came along with it. Um, there's three names here. Um, anybody know what the three names are about? Apple. These are the founders of Apple computers. Where, uh, everybody here who has an Apple phone knows it's worth eight hundred dollars <laughs> just for that. Apple, Apple computers. Three founders of Apple computers: Steve Jobs, uh, uh, Steve Wozniak, uh, Ron Wayne. Now, you've heard the first two names a lot, but you don't hear the name Ronald Wayne very much. You know why? So Ron Wayne, back in the late 70s, is looking at Apple Computer, and he's looking at uh, you know, all the work they put into it, and he owns 10% of it. The other guys own the rest. They uh, each own 45%, and he owns 10%, so he doesn't have a lot of it. He's really kind of wondering, is this really you know, all that great a thing? And so they say, OK, well, we'll buy you out. We'll buy you out. See how much he paid for his shares out of that 10% Apple? $800. So we'll give you eight hundred dollars. Uh, to be fair, they give him another thousand dollars next year, just just extra. Eight hundred dollars. So the article is going on to say that had he held on to that, you can guess it would have been worth uh, upwards of a billion dollars. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars in value had he held on. To it. But again, he decided it really just wasn't worth much. He really didn't do it. Here's kind of like uh, the paper this is signed on. Uh, the paper this was signed on was sold at auction about two years ago for a million dollars. <laughs> the paper they signed, a million dollars, he got eight hundred dollars for. It. And I thought it was something profound in that story to think about. And I was thinking about what the Hebrew writer says here in Hebrews chapter twelve. Uh, the book of Hebrews is all about the idea of hold on to your sock. But he uses the word sock. He uses the word inheritance. Hold on to your inheritance. Uh, like, it's a, like it's a note, like it's a card that says something that you've been given that at the end of, uh, the, end of the time you get to turn in for the great inheritance that's worth well, a billion dollars. You know, it's, it's a sum you can think of, but you know it's worth more than that. Hold on to it. Verse 14, pursue peace with all people, this is Hebrews chapter 12, and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any... Root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. When you put on Jesus Christ in baptism, Baptized because you confessed Jesus, you confessed him because you repented of your sins, you repented because you believed. You're given a certification. The Bible said the Holy Spirit is a seal on your heart. Uh, and, and I see that as a sense to say, here is God saying, here's the promise. The promise is, if you remain faithful unto death, it's yours. <laughs> now, now, you know, uh, uh, Ron Wayne was better with you know, time is going to pass for him regardless. If they held on to it or not, $800 isn't all that much. Esau traded the greatest birthright in history for a bowl of soup. This guy traded, you know, stock in one of the greatest companies in history for $800. And you and I have an inheritance that's worth more. And the irony is, a lot of times we traded for something less. We trade it for the knickknacks of this world and uh, the trivial things of uh, the, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Little things that are passing that actually make us feel worse. And then we've lost that great thing. You know I reminds Dill this several times in that book, don't neglect your salvation. Treasure it and hold on to it. If, you, if, you, if your salvation was a real literal certificate, I mean, would you put it in a, you know, would you just stick it in some book on the shelf and not think about it? Or would you put it in a lockbox somewhere? You'd, you'd say, I'm going to protect this for everything. Your salvation is something you ought to protect. You ought to be afraid of sin, knowing what it could do. And you'd say, I'm going to stay as far away from sin as I can because I don't want this getting damaged. I want to keep it safe. So the admonition I do all this time is to think about, first of all, this idea what you have in your hand is a stock that one day in your hand, in your heart. It's a stock that one day will be worth the greatest fortune 
Well, I, I can say in history, but that doesn't even qualify what it's worth. Don't lose it. But secondly, let me say, the second half of the things we have to say is, what would it be like if Ron White had never even had those stocks? What if uh, he had met Steve Jobs and, uh, you know, yeah, they, uh, he bumps into uh, Stephen Wolf's neck and, and he says, hey, uh, they say, hey, hey, would you like to be a part of our company? Yeah, no, I don't think so. Could you imagine what that would have felt like years later to say, I could have been there, but I didn't do it? Right now, you have the opportunity to buy into the kingdom of heaven. And it costs you. Uh, you would understand what I mean when I say it costs you nothing because the price has been paid. All you have to do is submit and obey the terms of it. And it's given to you. And the terms are, are you bring it in times to hear it, to believe it, to confess it, to turn away from the other things and to put on Christ. And to put on Christ gives you this certificate sealed by the Holy Spirit. And it's worth more than you can ever guess. Second thing we always offer is an opportunity. We'd sure love to see more people get hold of this stuff. We'd sure love for more people to be putting on Christ and having that promise of a reward. Because it would be unbelievable to stand before God one day and say, I had the chance to buy into the kingdom, but I let it go. Biggest mistake in my life. You guys have to talk to me about why don't you come up here and visit me while we stand and sing a song for the church. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you all?